William Hopley, your favorite videographer from Two Hats Publishing. I welcome you to another Two Hats special of community events. Let's look in and see what's really happening. And welcome to Lambda Weekly. I'm Dave Taffet, and I am here in the studio with Lauren Landis. I didn't read her text because I don't text in radio disc jockey. Um, Patty's out today. Why? Patty's out today. She's got the cooties. Oh, oh, okay. So <laughs> I, I eat allergies. I, I totally understand. Oh, I thought you were going over to give her a cootie shot afterwards. No. Oh, okay. Um, and we can talk like teenagers today because... Our guest is Michael O'Teeter. He is the Chief Program Officer for Big Brothers Big Sisters Lone Star, which is one of the largest Big Brothers Big Sisters chapters in the country, isn't it? It's the, the largest. The largest. Yeah. Okay, of course. It's Dallas. By, we have by, the biggest. By, by two, I think. Huh. By two times, I think, the largest of wow. the, almost 300 affiliates around the country. But it wasn't started here in Dallas. That's the interesting thing. No. Started in New York. Absolutely. Started in New York in 1904. Um, the story, as I understand it, is the boys kept coming through a county clerk's office, getting in trouble over and over again. And uh, at one point, the, the county clerk turned to somebody and said, we should find big brothers for these guys. Maybe that would make a difference. And sure enough, they pulled a, together a, uh, a meeting of, of men in the community, and they started doing that. And it, it kind of was birthed from there. That's awesome. <laughs> It's still a wonderful program. Uh, I did a story on it uh, a few weeks ago in the Dallas Voice, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, one thing about Big Brothers Big Sisters, they are a beneficiary of Black Tie Dinner this year, which, um, which is wonderful. You know, when people saw that, I think they were surprised. When I started looking into it, I think it's the best addition that we've made uh, to Black Tie. Um, your programs are completely welcoming of gays and lesbians and transgenders and bisexuals and even Laurent. Even Laurent. <laughs> Absolutely. So. But, and, and, but I'm really not kidding. They're completely, because I think most people, and I probably had this misconception partially to think that, oh, they probably don't want someone like me, but you do. Right. And, and I think that's... Uh, Actually, actually, is one of the reasons why we applied to be a beneficiary because I run across that so often. Is of, of even within my circle of friends, people being surprised that an organization who has a hundred and whatever year uh, history of working with children would uh, would quote let someone who's LGBTQ into the circle. And and the fact is, we have for I suspect forever and knowingly for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I've been uh, with our organization since uh, I run about 16 years and uh, came out to my boss then, myself, uh, uh, not long after coming to work there. And then it was with really within a couple of weeks, it made the national news that uh, our national organization, and I didn't know this, but they've been grappling with it for a little while and decided to officially take a stance to include sexual orientation into the policy and procedure because the fact is affiliates across the country had been a welcoming of LGBT people. But when you're in the business of trying to create healthy relationships and part of being healthy is to be good with yourself and open and honest to others. And, and here we're trying to do that for kids uh, and it starts with our volunteers. And so we needed to really say that up front. So um, uh, so that's been a, in a place for quite a long time. And, and, and years later, uh, even gender identity was added to that clause. But, mm -hmm. uh, but even with that, even the fact it was in the national news for a good amount of time, uh, there was still a need to, to to break that awareness barrier that we really are open to all folks. And that's true of all religion, all political parties, all whatever. We're a group that's looking to bring healthy people into the lives of children. So I, I think you're right. Um, people are surprised about um, the Boy Scouts of America, I'm sorry, about <laughs> um, Big Brothers and Big Sisters. Um, having added sexual orientation and gender identity because I think they do think of that organization along with like the Boy Scouts. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, it's for kids. They probably don't have that. Mm -hmm. right? Probably don't have us included. And when you all did include it, I don't remember it being that big of a deal in the news. Yeah, sometimes when you just do something and you just 
put it out there. It's not a big deal. Like when you came out to your boss, I'm sure uh, the attitude was, okay, you know, thanks for letting me know. We want, our, right. we want you to bring your whole self to work. Right. But I do remember, uh, you know, here starting in this job, and uh, I, I think it was Nightline, that day's me right there, I guess. But, you know, watching Nightline, that, those, that couple of weeks during that being the national news, and uh, our uh, national leaders up, you know, on one side of the screen and the other side of the screen was folks that were really arguing for the why LGBT people shouldn't be allowed to be around children. And it was, uh, it was disturbing because they're talking about what we do and you know, why are they worried about what we're doing? But at the same time, uh, it was uh, as an individual and as someone who's new to at this, with this organization, I was really gratified to see that at a national level, and it was true here locally as well, uh, stood by what was right and kind of weathered the storm. And after a while, after a while this kind of was no longer an issue. Mm -hmm. And frankly, when the gender identity uh, uh, was brought into our national standards and local standards, I don't recall any ripple effect of that at all. I don't recall any, any call or anything. So maybe it just shows in the 10 years or whatever that was. Uh, how much progress we've made nationally. Before we get into some some more stories about things that you do and how you affect the lives of kids, how many kids are you actually serving, your your organization, your local organization? And this year we'll uh, serve over 6,000 uh, youth, with each one with their own mentor. So that's 12,000 people involved in your program. Mm -hmm. um, how do you keep track of that many people? Well, we've what got a few staff who's, uh, I mean, we're really, we, we kind of divide our work into uh, different segments. You know, we have the folks that are out trying to recruit the volunteers. We have others that are uh, getting the word out to, to family members and schools and whatever groups that, that to let them know that if you have a child who needs a mentor, how to do that. And then we have teams of people to do all the interviewing, and then we have others. Once the, a, a volunteer and a child are matched together, whose full-time job is to is to support, uh, oversee, look after uh, upwards of a hundred matches, as we call it, a volunteer and a child together, we call it a match. So mm -hmm. it's yeah, it takes staff, takes time, takes resources, databases. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, yeah. I mean, that's an amazing number of kids whose lives you're mm -hmm. affecting. Um, and I don't mean LGBT kids, I mean just kids mm -hmm. of all everything, like you said, right. coming from all sorts of families. Um, okay, if somebody wants to volunteer, and maybe we should talk about this more at the end after people have heard a little bit more about Big Brothers Big Sisters, if somebody wants to volunteer and isn't sure, um, you know, I never worked with kids. I don't have kids. I sure like helping them. I like to see mm -hmm. kids succeed. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't mind paying my school taxes because I, when I'm at work, I want other people who I work around to be literate. Uh, you know, it's all, all those things, but I've never done it before. Mm -hmm. how, how, how do I even figure out if this is right for me? Well, for one, um, I think it's good to help people realize that we're not asking them to be foster parents mm -hmm. or teachers or taxi cab drivers or Santa Claus or anything. We're, at, uh, we're asking people just to be able to put themselves into the life of a kid to be their friend. And so when we talk to someone who's interested, uh, it really is just trying to help them realize that they do, in fact, have something of value mm -hmm. that by spending one on one time with a kid on, on a regular basis can really have an impact. So uh, it's, it's not the right thing for everybody. We know it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I mean, frankly, there's some people out there that we would choose for them not to be with the child. Oh, Laurent. But that, but that is, <laughs> no, we said that Laurent would be OK. But uh, but, you know, beside that, uh, I think um, whether you're really outgoing or you're really connected or really have money or don't have any of that, you probably have something that there's a kid there could benefit from. So part of our job is to find that right uh, mentor for the child and the right child for the mentor. And how, how do you match them? Um, do you put them together and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't? Uh, Sometimes it does, and I guess that's a fair statement. But uh, we uh, have we go to a lot of trouble trying to get to know the the child and, and frankly the family or the school situation they're in, as well as the mentor. Uh, we're looking for a variety of factors that would that we've learned over our years are predictive of what match relationship is likely to make it versus what is not likely to make it. And so we're, you know, it might be a similar interest. Uh, it might be. A, 
a, a team that has a certain challenge uh, that needs someone to help them with that, and here we find a volunteer who has experience with that challenge. You know, that might be an example. Uh, some factors like how close or far apart are they? Frankly, if I if I match Leron, I don't do you live in Dallas. Assume Leron's somewhere nearby. Garland. To Garland. If I match uh, Leron to someone who lived in Weatherford, it probably won't work, even if the best because just the driving across the metroplex would wear him down. After a while, he'd say, "I need to get out of this." So we're looking for someone who's within, you know, fifteen to thirty minute drive uh, from their homes. Um, again, similar interest, uh, skill sets, that sort of thing. And, and oh, go ahead. so. Um, for those people who are worried about their children going up with adults, before you quote unquote accept somebody, I'm assuming you do a, a very thorough interview and background check and that type of thing. Right. I, uh, if there's anything that Big Brothers Big Sisters is probably uh, known for, it's the the the, num the series of steps we take to make sure our kids are safe. Uh, some might even criticize it might be too much or take too long, but frankly, at the end of the day. We want to be able to say to that child, we want to be able to look at their parent or their guard in the eye and say, we have really vetted this person we're saying that you're going to, we're going to introduce you to because we do want that to be a safe situation. So for a volunteer, um, the process, if I can just kind of walk through that, um, it, it starts with an application. Nowadays, that's online. Um, the application isn't that long. Uh, they're then uh, behind the scenes. I have staff who run. Uh, criminal background checks. We look nationally. Uh, we look at child sexual abuse registry information, all those kind of due diligence things. Uh, we're also uh, checking references, obviously family members, people who know them from work per, uh, personally. We also ask uh, volunteers, have they done any work or volunteer work with children in the past? And if they say yes, we, we do all we can to check references with those people. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes folks that you would not want with the child kind of jump from place to place, and if there ever is a story, may not have ever been led to a, 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 a crime, may never be show up on a, a, a background check, we want to give a chance for folks who care about kids too to be able to say, you might want to just avoid this person. Mm -hmm. Don't dwell on that, but that's just part of our process. Uh, we yeah. check social media. Again, we're looking that's for folks that'll, that'll, that'll be uh, good representatives of the organization as well as uh, good role models for the youth. Uh, so all that's kind of happening behind the scenes after someone turns in their application. Uh, once that application is received, we have uh, our staff will call them up and set up an interview. So we spend about an hour and a half or so in a one-on-one -on -one interview with the volunteer. Uh, some of that's exploring safety concerns, but most of it, frankly, is looking at their uh, ability to commit because we're asking our volunteers to spend time with their youth they're mentoring, um, ideally every week, sometime every week, at least twice a month for at least a year. Uh, and and we need to look at, our. they may have really good intentions, but if they can't really commit to doing that, then we really rather find them another way to serve. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of our kids have had a lot of adults in and out of their lives, and we're not trying to add another one. It's gonna be short term. So, um, so the commit issue, and then the third area really we're looking at is what kind of child should they be matched with? So we're kind of exploring their interests, the things they would rather not deal with. We have folks that have you know, perhaps themselves were abused as a child. They would rather not be matched with a child who has that because it's just too close to home. We're, mm -hmm. So we're just trying to be sensitive on those issues. Or sometimes that might be or the right person. Exactly. That might be that exactly that, that in their history might be something they feel like is the strength that they could bring to someone who's going through that. And, so, and help the kid heal. Right. And so our staff ultimately yeah. will take all those things into consideration as mm -hmm. we're not only deciding which volunteer to accept, but who to match them to. Mm -hmm. um, how often do you? try a match and it doesn't work and so you move them on to the next one and does the parent of the child because mostly they're single parent families about probably about 75 percent of our kids happen to be from a single parent home it's not a requirement but that is a pretty frequent and approach. the ones who are from two parent homes is, well, are there different reasons uh, sure um uh, Laura and I were talking about this ahead of time. We, you know, uh, I, I really, we really work hard not to put a stigma on our kids that they have to be broken or some problem to be in the program. We think every every child, every one of us, could benefit from a mentor. Mm -hmm. yeah. But because resources are short, we want to make sure it goes to the kids that really could use it the most. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so again, a single parent would often be ones that would call and say, "I really, you know, especially say a mom or a grandparent saying, I, you know, my son could really use uh, someone to play ball with or do something.' So that that's a pretty typical scenario." But, uh, you know, it might be a, a, a parent in, in the military 
uh, an absent parent. Uh, it might be, we, we have a fair number of kids, sadly, have parents in prison. And so you're looking at that kind of a situation. Um, uh, you know, half of our programming is kind of school-based, where the volunteers, uh, um, the uh, children are brought to our attention because of a school teacher or, or a counselor who sees a need. And that child may have a very good home life and whatnot, but for whatever the case, the parent, the, the school teacher sees they need someone to give them some one-on-one -on -one attention. I, so, I can see one example of where a kid might have two parents and they just need the mentor. It's the LGBT kid who absolutely. just came out in school or, you know, a, and can't tell the parents for whatever reason. Right, right. Um, well, do, do you run into that one much? or? We, uh, yeah, and, and it seems like more and more mm -hmm. recently, frankly, uh, I think the research is backing up the fact that uh, LGBT kids are coming out sooner or... or, or well, to talk about it earlier, and so we are seeing that sort of thing come up more. Um, um, and if I could say too, David, just real quick, uh, one of the, the strengths, uh, there's some research out there about, and this could be true of anyone who cares about kids, as you look to build strengths and resilience in a child, one of the st strong things you can do is help bring other healthy adults into their life. Mm -hmm. So again, if you're a parent out there and you're trying to think, how can I help my child to be that much stronger, you know, a mentor could be a way to do that. That's, I think that's why people reach out to the scouts or football teams or band or whatever, because they're trying to bring other healthy adults into the child life. We're just another way to do that. We need to take a break in a minute, but how many kids who were menteed become mentors? How many bigs, uh, how many littles become bigs? I don't have do a know? number, but we yeah. hear that story all the time. Do you? Uh, all the time. And it's it's one of the, the the most gratifying things as someone who works in the field. So when I am uh, uh, hear that story, we have staff who are little mm -hmm. when they were young. I, I often will wear a, a big brother's or sister's branded shirt or something, and I'll be at, at the grocery store, and someone will go, you know, I was a little brother or a little sister in your program, or my sister, well, you know, whatever. It's just, it's just amazing the network of mm -hmm. folks who have been in the program or had a child in the program or something. And so it's, uh, it's we're kind of a little silent army out there of folks you think about the thousands of kids every year we're serving and the and the, the number of touches that that occur that uh, uh you know but we don't have a building we don't all show up in one spot it all happens throughout the community and mm -hmm. pretty cool thing yeah um and we're going to talk a little bit about you know how do you train somebody who isn't gay to work with a kid who turns out to be or how do you um you know, if you're an LGBT, how do you deal with the parent who doesn't want that LGBT uh, right. mentor uh, with their kid? Um, words aren't coming out today. Uh, you're listening to Lambda Weekly on 89.3 Cano and FM. I'm David Teffitt, and I'm here with Lauren Landis. The late Patty Fink is extremely late, and she'll be back with us next week. Uh, Mike Oteter is our guest. He's the chief program officer from Big Brothers Big Sisters Lone Star. I'm Jelinski Brown with Resource Center United Black Element, and I listen to Lambda Weekly Radio Program on 89.3 K9, the voice of the people. I am the people, so hear me speak. And welcome back to Lambda Weekly. We are talking to Mike O'Teeter. He is Chief Program Officer for Big Brothers Big Sisters Lone Star. First of all, with all of, you know, with so many people coming out and whatever, uh, what about any big gender neutrals? Oh, absolutely. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. So you really do want a big, diverse, you're looking for the person. You are not looking for any kind of a stereotype because there are all kinds of kids out there. Exactly. And I think uh, that's one of the things I actually enjoy because we'll, every once in a while my staff will come up and say, I have this volunteer who has this about them. It's like, well, we would call that maybe a volunteer that's hard to match but not, not an issue of eligibility. It's just mm -hmm. a matter of that, that volunteer needs a specific kind of child or a specific you know, situation. And, we'll, and we'll, we're upfront with our volunteers about that sort of thing. You know, so many times we have um, transgender people on the show mm -hmm. and most of them have come out later. It, it just wasn't available a, as kids. The um, Williams Institute has doubled the estimate for number of transgender people in this country this year. Uh, originally, their estimate was 0.4% of the population. Now it's 0.8% of the population. Um, there are so many trans people who've come out later, and they're looking at these young teenagers who are coming out as transgender uh, 
themselves they're not you know they're not transitioning necessarily but maybe uh presenting as the opposite sex or as the, the sex they understand themselves to be i would think you'd have a big need for transgender uh bigs and by the way the terms are for big brother big sister big couple big whatever um it's those are the bigs and uh the kids are the littles Right, and and we use mentor more and more or mentee a lot too. I like so, bigs and littles. But, uh, yeah, I, I just that's like historically that. Historically, what we've called yeah. them. So. Yeah, we uh, uh, actually it, it goes back to when we, uh, for me when we first were looking at applying to be a beneficiary of black tie. Um, that same week, I had a student apply to be an intern from uh, UT School of Social Work, and I work with a lot of interns. And I saw on her uh, resume that she had volunteered in Denton for a group called Outreach Denton. And I thought, huh. And so I called her and I said, Bobby, what is this Outreach Denton thing? And she told me it's a youth group that supports uh, LGBTQ youth and uh, gave me a little history. And I called uh, the woman that's been dealing with that and I talked to her about it and she told me, I actually, we met for coffee later that week and um, I just very quickly learned a lot about this group and the need in Denton. You need to think about the need in uh, the Dallas and one of it, this up in Denton. Of uh, these youth that needed a safe space, mm -hmm. and uh, the Unitarian Church there had, ho had hosted this group uh, for years, and she had been part of it for a while. You know, the way that it started was the pastor at that church uh, moved here from San Francisco, and when she realized there was nothing for yeah. the uh, mm -hmm. for gay youth up in that area that the closest was 30 miles away she was horrified it was like about the first program that she instituted when she came here well, they're doing some good work and um and Kat, Ralph is the person I've been referring to, but Kat said, you know, Mike, a couple of years ago when I first started, I had like three or four kids that would come every Sunday. And, and so I was able to give them a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention. And so now I've got 25 to 30 show up. And I can't be what they need. And that's where it hurt, you know, just so the stars lined up that we were looking to who could we partner with is the need out there and whatnot. And she says, I have a lot of youth. And she said she had a lot of transgendered youth, a lot of gender neutral youth. And uh, and and really wondered is is this could we really meet that need and so um, uh, it's been about two months ago actually again outreach and helped us host a uh, volunteer recruitment event and we they use their social network circles and whatnot and we had about 20 25 adults uh, some transgendered some uh, we had a straight couple with their kids, little kids with them. We had all in between, oh, and awesome. uh, uh, and it was really gratifying to see there were folks that saw, again, there's a need, and we're looking for a way to connect. So we we actually had several volunteers that have gone through that whole process and are ready for a child. And so tonight we're actually going to uh, meet with the youth for the they just started up now. School started to uh, talk to them about what having a mentor would look like, and mm -hmm. um, and so I think we'll see. Frankly, I, I know we're going to see out of this some uh, uh, transgender youth and uh, volunteers come together because that's what the need is. That's I know, great. Um, yeah. I want to go back to a potential or possible uh, when you were recruiting put a possible bigs uh, or a big brother or a big sister. I know you said that um, they're not, they don't have to be Santa Claus or they don't have to be, you're not asking them to be a foster parent. Mm -hmm. um, but what are some of the things that they actually do when as part of their mentoring? Um, really, we just ask the volunteer to include the, the, the youth in what they do. Um, you know, I, I remember with my first uh, little brother, and we were matched for seven years, and, you know, we, would, we did a lot of different things. It, all, it seemed like it always ended up with going out to eat somewhere. But, you know, it might be going to a, a, a sporting event, or we, we saw different, uh, you know, we see, we'd go to movies, we'd go just, do, just doing things. And... Uh, that's the main thing. It's just being willing to, to involve a child into mm -hmm. what you do. Uh, we one, do ask one of the things is you don't have to pay for all of it. Big Brothers, Big Sisters gets blocks of tickets sometimes mm -hmm. to different things and will help out with supplying those tickets. Yes, I mean, we, we don't ask... We do ask our volunteers if they if they choose to do something, it is out of their pocket. It's not they're not going to expect the child to pay to go to Six Flags, for right, example. Right, of course. But David, your point's a really good. One. We it's just part of how do people help us. Sometimes the way they can help us is just to, to pass on free tickets to things, pass on discount opportunities, and so we get that. And I, and I remember again working for the organization as well as volunteering as a big brother. Uh, 
we got to take advantage of a lot of that kind of stuff. And I mean, to, to the extreme, I mean, Shaquille and I got to sit on the floor of a Maverick game one time and talk about being treated like kings. We, I mean, it was a nice experience. And, uh, and years later, I mean, he, uh, I mean, we had not been matched for a while, and I think he was 20, 21 years old. We were actually walking, and I asked him what his favorite thing to do, and it wasn't, it wasn't the Maverick game. It was just talking. Really? Mm-hmm. You know, awesome. And, okay, so a few weeks ago, I guess a couple of months ago now, I did a story about Dennis and James. They are a big couple. Um, one of them decided that he wanted to be a big brother, and the other one was just going to let him do his thing and realize he has to go through a background check, too. Okay, I might as well participate, and that's how both of them got involved. Mm-hmm. They were matched with a couple of uh, different kids, and those kids' parents said, uh-uh. Uh, the person that they were finally matched with, uh, the mom said, thank God for the other parents' ignorance. Uh, they've been with their little now for about 10 years. And um, the mom said, you know what? I hear him on the phone with uh, either Dennis or James, uh, just talking to him, to one of them about things they don't want to talk, that he doesn't want to talk to me about. Uh, so when you say just talking is right. the important thing, right. um, that was when I talked to him, he said the, same the exact thing. same thing yeah. that they have such a close relationship that he can talk to them about anything. Right. Uh, and he's not hiding anything from his mother. And his mother is delighted that he has these uh, two guys to talk to. Uh, she said anything he needs, they're there for him. Uh, they were on their way one time to Fort Worth. Uh, they had theater tickets. And she found out at the last minute it was dad's night at school. And they, one of them answered the phone, the cell phone and, uh, in the car, and he said, ooh, we're on our way to Fort Worth. We're turning around. We will be there late, but we'll be there. And they were there for him. Um, I mean, th- these two have just been invaluable to this guy's life. Well, it's, a great, it's a great story, frankly, uh, but uh, it's a good example, too, because uh, uh, this boy had lost his dad. His mm-hmm. dad had died. And, uh, when he was about five. Yeah, or so, so his yeah. mom, and she's a phenomenal woman. I mean, she really is uh, one of our great advocates and helps us in many regards. And, and, and Roger, the boy who's now 16, is going to be somebody special. So he already is somebody special, but he's going to be somebody as an adult. But, um, you know, it's a good testimony of when you keep the focus on what does the, the child need. <laughs> A lot of these other stuff kind of sets aside. So when and you mentioned the process, when when we think we have a good match between an adult and a child, before we tell either party who the other person is, we call them and say, we had this volunteer, in this case, the, a parent, we had this volunteer who we think would be good for your son. Here's some things about them. And then the parent, without knowing the person, can say yes or no. I and mean, that's just part of our respect for the, the parent and guardian. Uh, and like you said, in this case, several folks turned him down. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and it may very well have been because they disclosed that it was a gay couple. They hadn't met them or anything. No, they, they never just, met. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. like anything, a personal thing. But, you know, frankly, we would not have wanted make, to match Dennis uh, uh, and James to uh, a child in a family that would not be supportive. That wouldn't be fair to them. And it wouldn't be fair to the child. So. Uh, we do and they wouldn't that. have had a relationship that lasted 10 years. Absolutely. And yeah. the fact that we found a parent who goes, nope, that didn't bother me any. Or even if, she, I, I don't think it did, but if, say in a case where she might have had some qualms, she also knows she has the support of the organization that's going to help her through that. Mm-hmm. And uh, But regardless, in this case, from day one, she was totally good because the focus was on her son, and the, and the guy's focus was on her son. Well, and Roger really described their thing. first time together. Uh, one of the dads was on the uh, sofa just talking to the mom and or not dads one of the bigs was on the sofa talking to the mom and the other one was on the floor playing video games with uh, with Roger and he said he remembers that so clearly Uh, but that's kind of how their relationship has developed and and they're a family now Um, that's and, and when I say they're a family that's not really the goal it, when that happens, that's special. Right. Uh, we are trying to create friendships to start with, but we also want friendships that will last. Mm-hmm. 
And if, if they're healthy and they're for the right purposes and they last, then who knows what comes out of that, right? And so I do, we hear, yes, about do we have many former littles become bigs, and we do. But, uh, but we have a lot of stories where you hear someone say, I've been matched to my little brother for 24 years. Mm-hmm. We, literally this week, I wish I, I meant to bring it actually, we got a letter from a, a Dallas man who um, said, and it was a hundred dollar check inside of it, which was kind of, was nice, a little, mm-hmm. little extra, but he, he was letting us know, he was giving the hundred dollars in honor of his little brother on the 24th anniversary of their match. Oh wow. And he had just gotten his um, wings as a Southwest Airlines pilot. Hmm. And just wanted to say, it wasn't saying thanks to us. It was just in honor of his little brother. Mm-hmm. And we were the ones, the recipients of not really so much the check, but just what a nice, affirming piece mm-hmm. of good news. And uh, and we, so we, you hear a lot of that sort of thing to people. And someone, their wedding, you know, the little's been in their wedding, or they, whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. And so when those things happen, you know we've done our job because we've you know, we've launched these two strangers into a relationship that 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 made it. And our, you know, our, our bellwether is, did they make it to that first year? We want to say, that's why I asked for that commitment mm-hmm. for at least one year. Because typically, if they can make it to one year, you got them hooked. And they're going to get, you know, our average length of match, if we will, is one of the metrics we follow, mm-hmm. is, is right about three years. And one thing Roger and James will tell you immediately, if you have any question at all about this, is, I don't care what he got out of it, this has been invaluable to us. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have gotten more out of it than he could possibly have gotten from us. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so Big Brothers Big Sisters is very affirming of gay kids, uh, gay bigs. Sometimes you're going to match somebody who the, the big and the parent, they're fine with each other. And then the kid comes out. Right. And very often, you know, when you came out, Laurent was the first person you came out to your parents? <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, in my family, it was like, yeah, you didn't need to come out. I never did. They said, we grew up with you. We knew. Um, but, you know, very often you're coming out to somebody else who you're close to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in this case, you have a trusted relationship. You might come out to your big. Um and it could be somebody who is straight, who has, you know, perfectly good intentions and doesn't know how to deal with that. What kind of training or what kind of preparation or what kind of help is available to that big if that happens? Well, and, and what you're talking about is something that we've become increasingly aware of is if, if um, uh, you know, if the general population has, you know, what's three, six, whatever that number is that, that you'll hear, uh, in a, a, is LGBTQ, then if we're dealing with 6,000 kids, that that story will happen. Uh, and you may have that situation where the child doesn't ever tell, even they're big, don't tell anybody till they're much older. Mm-hmm. But uh, ideally, if we, and this is, what our, this is our goal, is to um, bring into our program adults that are by nature, uh, or at least able to be trained and supported to be open, safe, affirming people for whatever might come down the line. So, um, you know. So to you, it's not a sexual orientation thing. It's a, something's going to happen with this kid. There's going to be some issue about something. Life will happen. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and again, and all our our promotional materials, our application, it says in there, you know, we don't discriminate based on lots of factors, including, you know, anything LGBTQ related. So, um, so if that's a problem for a volunteer, you know, we try to flush that out up front. Uh, equally, if they have a problem with any other big issue, then we need to know that because we're looking for someone who could handle, has, that has the potential of handling whatever might play out over the course of the relationship that, they, that they're that they going to enter into. And so some of that, again, is looking for the right kind of person. Our training, our, our screening really is guiding them uh, in regard to how to be sensitive to the life the child leads and their family, not to put their values on them, not to put their beliefs on them, but how to, how, you know, kind of be child-centered and uh, uh, respect to the family. You know, when you're dealing with people of different economic backgrounds and different, there's a lot of those, these things just come up. And so it's not our, our volunteer's job to save the kid, to fix the kid, to change the, 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 the youth. So uh, in the spirit of that, anything related to LGBTQ, you have to kind of ride along there with it, right? So we also want to create, we, we train our folks on how to de- develop relationships, how to, how to 
uh, have interactions that are open into questions and not a series of yes, no, and to, to create an environment in your relationship that a child does feel like, I, I, I know this is a safe place to talk about anything. And if they live that out over the course of their relationship, then the odds are if that child uh, is thinking about coming out or not sure about what they, what, how they feel and all this kind of stuff, that will most likely be someone they do feel like they can talk to. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, of course, all of our mentors have what we call a match support specialist. It's a staff person's full-time job is to be there and support their match. And so part of their training up front is if anything comes up that you're not sure about, you call your match support specialist and you'll get that one-on-one -on -one training and guidance. So, uh, um, so yes, we had that happen mm -hmm. a fair amount of time. And, uh, and again, I'm, I'm thankful that we have a lot of good um, stories of people talking about how helpful it was to have somebody to talk to. And we get the same thing from parents, you know, that, that their mentor ends up being helpful to them as they deal mm -hmm. together with their child kind of deciding what and, to do. And, uh, you know, when I started that first story on Big Brothers, Big Sisters, if I had a Michael for every story I was working on, my job would be easy because he didn't give me one story. He gave me, you know, he, he thought I was going to do like three or so <laughs> small stories Dennis and James's story was so long. I have another one that I'm doing. It was a dad who called me. Uh, he has a trans son and uh, who has a big sister. And the son came out to the big sister first. Father's all on board with it is, but said, this big sister saved my kid's life because uh, he had somebody to talk to and she was just great and she actually, in that case, I, I, I have to give him a call before I actually write. But she actually helped uh, the son come out to the dad uh, because they had such a good relationship that had been going on not as long as Dennis and James, but uh, just just a great relationship there. Um, and in the case of trans kids, I mean, the suicide rate among transgender people is astronomical. We could literally say this big sister saved uh, her little, little brother's life. I think I heard on one of your previous broadcasts, you mentioned that uh, I think having someone safe to talk to, you know, could increase your chances 30 percent or something like mm -hmm. that, that, that that child will make it through. Yeah. I think that's a good example of where that's yeah. probably true. Mm -hmm. We need to take and a break. He's a good father. Uh, right. Yes. Yes. Um, we need to take a break. We're, you're listening to Lambda Weekly on 89.3 KNON FM. I'm Dave Taffet. I'm here with Ron Landis. Um, Josh is on the board. And uh, Michael Teeter is our guest. He's the chief program officer for Big Brothers Big Sisters Lone Star, which is the largest, of course, we're Dallas, uh, the largest Big Brothers Big Sisters of 300 different chapters around the country. We're the, we're the, the king of the Big Brother Big Sisters. Right. We're the... Not king, we're the king and queen. King and queen. Yeah, there you uh, go. That, that's it, that's it. We'll be back with more Lambda Weekly right after this. Hi, this is Valletta Lil, and I listen to Lambda Weekly. I hope that you will too. And welcome back to Lambda Weekly. I'm Dave Taffet, and I'm here with Ron Landis. Ron, you had a question. I'm assuming some of the big sisters and big brothers have children of their own. Mm -hmm. Are they allowed to, and if so, do they incorporate? when they have a little to do things with their children? Uh, great question. The, um, I mean, the bottom line premise of what we do is about one-to-one -one relationships. So when we have a child who's coming to us, we're looking for an individual who really will invest their full-time attention, right? Uh, now, you mentioned with uh, uh, James and Dennis, that was an example of a couple. So. Uh, so we have two people giving their full-time attention to a kid, so that's pretty special. Uh, but we do have another variation. It's not like we have a lot of this, but, but it's one of the options of having what we call a big family. And so oh, cool. uh, we would rather, if, if the intent is to um, involve your spouse uh, or partner with the, the student you're mentoring, then let's put it out up front and get everybody in the fold from the standpoint of screening, training, support, uh, and including if they have children. So, um, you know, that's just one of the things we would assess uh, is, is, is the family really in a good spot to be able to bring in another child and how did they, we even actually talked with the kids and their family and, uh, you know, how, what do they think about this or, you know, how this work and, and, and it's actually pretty special. But again, if you think back to the premise of just include a child in the life you're already living, that's an opportunity for you to do that and it's an opportunity for a child to see how family works, you know, and some good role and, and, and so, Laurent, to answer your question, um, Danny, who wants, still wants another kid? 
<laughs> yes. uh, this might be the good compromise. Right. <laughs> it could be. Um, when it is a big family, do you try to find, you know, Gabrielle is eight? Eight. Okay, Gabrielle is eight. Would you want a kid who's also eight in there? Would you prefer somebody older or younger? Uh, or it, every case is different. Uh, every case is different. So I think when we, if a family came and said, this is what we want, we would explore what is it they want? What's, why do they think that would be a good thing? And so if they say, you know, I've got an eight-year-old daughter who would love to have another eight-year-old little girl to hang out with, you know, then we look at, is that really a, a good thing? Is, and, and if he's on board, we'd be on board. If they say we'd rather look for a teenager or whatever it might be. It really, that's a beauty of what we do, you know, because we're not tied to any one group or school or anything, we can we can roll with every individual situation. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's really what So makes you'll be getting your application. Well, there you go. <laughs> soon, uh, I, I think that's a great compromise. Uh, I think so too. You know, it's a once a week commitment, and that's it, Laurent. Right, right. It's, it's not what you went through when you got pregnant and <laughs> you know you lost your figure and uh, it, I, I, you totally I, did. If I can share a story, though, when you ask that question about, uh, you know, the other thing that comes up sometimes is can our, our little siblings be engaged with the mentor? Because, you know, again, when I was matched to Shaquille, who was one of, um, of four kids in his, in his uh, family, uh, especially his younger brother, would look at go pick him up, and he'd look at me like, I want to go, too. And it was right, kind of hard right. not to involve him, right? And, and frankly, we worked to get all of them mentors, so that was... Uh, that was kind of a cool thing, but uh, uh, his younger brother's mentor was traveled a lot. So when we would do special activities and I gave these tickets to the things, mm -hmm. every once in a while I'd get permission to bring his younger brother with me. And uh, the first time we did that, we did an activity. And then as I said earlier, we always went out to eat. And so I turned to Shaquille and said, where should we go eat? And he goes, can we go to that menu place? And I looked at him like, what? And he goes, that menu place. And, you know, and again, it goes back to what you do. And somewhere along the line, we did go to McDonald's or we went to some place that had a menu and he, that struck some, to Shaquille, and he wanted his little brother to experience that. Mm -hmm. So it goes. So it's, yeah, that we can even involve others from time to time. But again, my staff will get mad at me if I don't reinforce this. this is about one-to-one -one relationships, and we're trying to protect <laughs> right. that as well. But gotcha. but that was a really special uh, moment for Shaquille and me both, mm -hmm. actually. Um, when Roger Roger's mom uh, decided that he needed a big brother. Um, she had just lost her husband. She went to a grief support group, and it was somebody in her group who suggested that her kid might benefit from, you know, having a big brother, uh, you know, having somebody to help her while she's dealing with the death of uh, her husband. Yeah. If anybody's listening who has a kid that needs a big brother, you know, we talked about you go to the website if you want to be a big. What if you have somebody who is a little and needs somebody? Yeah, the, the same thing, and I think I think part of what we want to do is is empower everybody to advocate for kids and so i think if you had that kind of child in your life or in your in your family or you're a teacher or whatever uh speaking up on their behalf is good uh talking to their parent or guardian just as as uh, someone spoke to roger's mother i think is a healthy thing to do uh getting a child enrolled in our program is not that hard uh, it's just a matter of outreach uh, again we have uh, our if, if someone goes to our website the uh that process starts online, so mm -hmm. it's pretty easy. Or they can call us, and uh, and it, it involves similar things. There's there's an application, there's an interview. Uh, again, looking forward to the understanding what having a mentor is and what it's not. Uh, are they in a position to commit to the relationship as well? Mm -hmm. uh, is the parent going to be an active participant? Because we need their set of eyes on what's going on as well. Uh, and can they commit over the long haul? And so. Um, uh, Yes, yeah, so if, if someone knows a child that could benefit it, it, most often you're looking at probably seven years old as the youngest. We, we can take someone who's six, uh, and, and usually about to about age of 14, because we want our matches to last two, three years, mm -hmm. and, uh, and typically when kids graduate from high school, they start to kind of go their different directions, sure. so we want to give them plenty of time. So if you know someone in that age range, I think it's just a matter of making that referral. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of children who've already made that phone call. Our waiting list is about mm -hmm. 3,000 in the Dallas Fort Worth area. Wow. Uh, huh. uh, and so, um, not that I want to say that to discourage anyone for reaching out for help, but that's just our reality. We've got to find volunteers. So, uh, but there's these cases like the one, the, the outreach group in Denton, where 
we talk with them and they're not talking seven to 14 year olds, they're talking 13 to 17 year olds. And in that case, we've partnered to say, if we can work together to find volunteers that are gonna be in a position to work with 13 to 17 year olds and they're willing to commit for the long haul, mm -hmm. then we are too. So, so sometimes groups can line up the, the age range. Might be yeah, and different. in their case, they provided the, the littles, but they're also working Helping with you to, to find the bigs, Absolutely. which is, I mean, so, that's perfect. Which is part of our master plan, if you will, is how to find more groups like that mm -hmm. across North Texas and frankly, in other parts of the state where we can find those kind of parts to help us not only find kids, but find volunteers. Okay, so once somebody has been approved for the program um, and they are they haven't been matched yet, but they have been approved, they've gone through background checks, how much training is there that they need to do? You know, our training, I mean, all through the interview and enrollment process, we're talking with them, so you, you can almost call that training, I guess, but uh, the actual training is an online course. It's about an hour and a half, so it's not that long, really. Uh, and then once they get matched, they, again, they have a match support specialist who's talking to them uh, uh, at least once a month uh, for some length. And every one of those conversations is a, an element of ongoing guidance and training. Mm -hmm. And then we have staff that provide ongoing training as well, webinars, in-person, you know, training type things. So it's, it's really kind of a life of the match long mm -hmm. training and support system. So why don't we tell, how do people get in contact with you? Well, our website is the uh, is the best way. Uh, it's www.bbbstx.org. Uh, that's our general website. Uh, if someone is specifically looking as an LGBTQ person to be a mentor or uh, an LGBTQ youth uh, might become in the program, then then I would encourage them to go to the, the part of that website uh, where you'd add on the forward slash LGBTQ. So again, bbbstx.org forward slash LBGTQ and uh, the applications, there's information about the program there. Um, they can kind of play around the website and just kind of learn more about us. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the, uh, the link to apply is there. Uh, we've, we've gotten to where we try to go paperless, so there's a few steps that will guide you through on how to give you a permission to get your signature and the documents, you know, and those kind of stuff. But just to walk through that process and then Within uh, within a, a, a couple of days, Max, someone should be calling the back and talking to them about the next steps, which would be setting up the mm -hmm. in-person interview. You know, one, one group that I can imagine would be great with kids, uh, you know, nobody gets along with their parents, but everybody gets along with their grandparents. Um, and now that I'm well into my fourth decade of my 30s, uh, I, I, I've been talking to a lot of people. I have younger cousins who are retired. It's driving me crazy because mm -hmm. they all want to know when I'm moving to Florida with them. And I know personally I would go out of my stark raving mad mind uh, sitting in Florida because I wake up, I figure out who I'm going to piss off that day. I go do it. I have a wonderful day. I, I just couldn't do that. But seniors who have right. time on their hands um, and and also I mean as an older person now Lauren you must see this how much more patient I am <laughs> why are people here laughing um, I think is that a be an excellent uh, mentor so yeah I, I mean the age range for our volunteers is you gotta be at least 18 mm -hmm. uh, we celebrated a big sister a couple years ago who was 101 Wow. And so we really do span the age. I do think, you know, for a, for a lot of folks, you know, when they're, when they're having their own children or they're brand new in their job, it might be a little harder to take on mm -hmm. another person, though many, many do. So, but you'll, you know, we see kind of, if you look at the, the curve of the most number of volunteers for an age group, you know, you see a lot of people in the college, post-college, early mm -hmm. career time, and maybe a little bit of dip, you know, but then you see that pick up when they, hit their 40s or 50s and uh, and again they've lived some life they maybe they had kids of their own they kind of learned from their mistakes or what worked well for them and so all, all of that's very possible but we, we I don't think we, I shared earlier we really volunteers can choose one of three paths too they, you, we have programs where you go to the child's home and you go do things out in the community that's very engaged with a parent and whatnot we have other programs where you see the child at their school uh, some of our partnerships might be like at a Boys and Girls Club or another location where the volunteer goes to that location after school with mentors. Uh, uh, and we have, um, uh, we do have a program called Generations where we actually partner with retirement centers and we mm. bring kids from schools and they see their, their mentors at the retirement center. And that's talk about a cool program because you're talking about 
you know, like kids having grandparents again, mm-hmm. and then the benefits those folks get by having kids show up every week to see them. It's really pretty nice. And then the, the third big program is what we call Mentor 2.0, which is for those folks that are probably in their jobs and traveling more, makes it possible because that mentoring is online. So th- we partner with groups of high school students, and uh, we, we take over an entire class of high school students, and every student has a mentor. And our student, our staff goes into that class every week and teach, teaches a lesson on college and career preparation and then during class time they write their mentor online and there's a platform they sign into and there's prompting questions and the mentor has the whole week to write them back most of us spend plenty of time online that writing an additional equivalent of an email but it's structured Mm -hmm. is not that hard and then once a month they go to the school and it's all dates are predetermined so you already know what dates for the whole school year Mm -hmm. and you show up and we feed you dinner and your the mentors and mentees spend time together at the school and we have fun activities and so for a lot of folks they're kind of maybe earlier in their career or travel a lot or have younger children that program can find a way so every, there really is a place for every child and for every volunteer. Oh, okay we skipped over this big sister who's 101 years old mm-hmm. how many littles has she had well she was in our generations program so she was a, a resident of a retirement center uh-huh. and uh, she mentored we introduced her to a, a little boy in this case uh, when he was in the third grade and she was with him till he went into middle school hmm. and so I think that was her that really was her one experience oh, okay. but because uh, I was expecting yeah, she, she might have been mentoring before in her life before see her, I was expecting her little no, who just turned 80 no <laughs> came to the party no but we uh, uh, Dell Long is one of our lifers uh, uh-huh. I saw him the other day and he he is I think on his seventh or eighth boy he's mentored starting when he was in his 20s and now hmm. he's I don't want to aging, but uh, yeah, he's now been around he's in for his a while. extremely late twenties. Yeah, extremely late twenties, and I mean, it's amazing to see this. And it's not like one or two years at a time. He's mentoring these kids five, ten years, and he's got these wonderful stories. And he's mm-hmm. one of our ambassadors to say, you know, you're not necessarily committing for life, but you could. <laughs> well, going back to Dennis and James, I asked Roger where he's thinking of going to school, and he's thinking of going out of state. And Rod, mm-hmm. uh, Dennis and James are thinking. Uh, you know, that's going to be a big trip for us to go visit him, uh, you know, yeah. in, in college. They have no intentions of giving him up. Absolutely. So. Help with that. I mean, that will be a lifelong sure. trip, I have no doubt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's that's when everybody gets something out of it. Lauren, I could see um, your family deciding, you know, it's once a week or so. That would be a great way. We have so many things we want to do with Gabrielle, and now we'll have the excuse that we have to do those things that always get put off. Yeah. And and you'll just go do it. Oh, yeah. We, we, we sign up for something. We're dedicated. No, I know you are. Yeah. I, I know you are. I have no question. I, I'm just saying that it would be for you nothing more than, because you're saying, Mike, that you know you don't want you want the individual attention you want them to commit that time i'm saying i think you need this much tiny bit push all these things we've been meaning to do anyway this gives us the excuse to do them yeah well and it gives you a sense of accountability that probably too often we mm-hmm. don't have with the the children that are in our lives mm-hmm. yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. yeah so um okay so uh uh, just a quickie recap because we are at the end of the show. Um, if you are LGBT, there are lots of LGBT kids out there that could use a mentor. Um, yes. You're looking, you're really looking for somebody not who's hiding that they're gay. You want them to bring themselves we want to people the program. To be authentic, absolutely. You want them to be authentic because that that helps us put them in a in a relationship that's going to be more successful and mm-hmm. and, uh, and frankly I, one of the things I want to make sure people understand though there are plenty of LGBTQ youth that could use someone as a role model we want to be in a place of service that someone who's LGBTQ can come and just be a mentor yeah mm-hmm. I mean my first four kids that I mentored were not LGBTQ mm-hmm. I mean and that didn't make me any less effective right them any less you know but uh, it's it's nice to know if you're if you're prone to want to serve, here's a, here's a welcoming place to do so. Mm-hmm. Mike, thanks for being here. Thank you so much. We yeah. are just about out of time. Uh, next week, our guest is Brendi Amara Sky. She's a lot of fun to talk to, so we'll have a fun show next week. Uh, Mike, thank you. Uh, Lauren, we'll see you next week. Josh, who knows? <laughs> thank you very much. This is William, hopefully your favorite videographer from Two X Publishing. 
I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like it, please leave comments below or like, follow, or subscribe to us and get notices of all our videos. We love it even when you call.